Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, like this, this talk is about Spy. Uh, what is Spy? Well, it's hard to define. Uh, we could, it's a compiler. Um, we can say that it's a compiler for Python. Maybe we can say compiler for a variant of Python. We will see later uh, what I mean exactly. But before I start, uh, I would like to, to, to show like my motivation behind this. So, how many of you like Python? Yes, that's what I expected. I, well, if, if I didn't see any hands, <laughs> it would be. How many of you would like Python to be faster? Okay. How many of you know how to make Python faster? Oh, okay, I want to talk to you later, <laughs> because I don't. I mean, I spent a lot of time doing uh, PyPy, historically, uh, which was Python JIT compiler. We tried to make it faster. Uh, I think there is a limit at, at which we can, the performance you can reach with that approach. So the idea with Spy is really, let's make a thought experiment and let's try to imagine something which is still Pythonic, it feels like Python, and we, it has all the nice features that we like about Python that when we raised the hands before, but we remove a bit of the dynamicity so to make it easier to compile and faster to execute. So this is kind of the underlying motivation behind my, my work here. I claim that a big problem, the, the fundamental problem uh, in Python performance is that the compiler, if you, if you are a Python compiler and want to make Python, fast Python, um, fast executable out of a Python uh, uh, source code, you don't have much information. Like if you're a human and if you look at this code, it's obvious what it does. I mean, we are importing NumPy, thank you. Uh, N is clearly a constant and the value is 10. And then we are a function which takes an array of floats and a constant. And then, I mean, if you read the code, you know what it does. But if you're a compiler, you cannot assume anything. Because NumPy could be not be NumPy. Could be another package or I could uh, uh, made some magic with these of the modules or I can add an import hook and then who, I don't know what is this module. And it could be changed elsewhere from another module in, at any point in time later. Uh, the type annotation could just lie because Python doesn't check them. Um, so, like, there is this gap between uh, what is good code. Like, this code really does what, it, what, 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 you, what you imagine because it will never pass a code review. Like, if you do too much strange stuff, well, it's bad code and you should not write it. But as a compiler, I cannot assume anything because I need to try to comply with all these strange semantics. I claim that in practice, the vast majority of people already use a subset of Python and uh, uh, in which most of strange stuff don't, don't actually happen in practice. And in the latest years, there, was, there is a lot of people using and liking static typing because of safety and robustness and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the way it's done currently, it doesn't help performance at all because it's just ignored. And it's not safe because the interpreter actually um, doesn't check the types and uh, MyPy or PyWrite, uh, they are basically linters, and there are a lot of escape edges in which you can have a program which actually fails at runtime, even if it passes the type check. So, like, it doesn't buy you much. It buys you something. I, I, people find it useful, but I think that we can do better. So, one of the problems is that the type system that we use in Python was, like, kind of put on top of the existing language. So, the idea is, let's try to design something from scratch with these goals in mind be safe, to be fast, and to be Pythonic. I'm fully aware that there are tons of other projects like this. There is Namba, there is AirPython, which is actually what I come from, from the PyPay land. Cyton, we can consider it like uh, something like this. PyTorch has its own JIT with its own set of restrictions. So uh, MyPyC is another example. Um, I mean, there are many of them. So I'm just adding a new one, so I'm just adding a like, lot of uh, noise somehow. Uh, I claim that the idea of spy kind of fix the other end of the, of the wire, because all these languages try to fix the inner loop program, problem. So you have 
numerical computation, you have a while loop, and you do stuff on arrays, and you want them to be faster, and usually we have a lot of solution for this. We don't have really a good solution for a full-scale, object-oriented uh, mm, features, like in, in which you can write the whole program and, and, and have it fast. So Spy tried to solve this kind of problem. The f it's very important to explain, to, to underline, a non-goal is to be compatible with Python. Like, you, you, the goal is not to take a random Python package, compile it, and have it faster. I don't think it's possible, actually. I'm pretty sure that Mark, who I see is over there, disagree with me because he's trying to make C Python faster. But there is a limit of what you can do without changing rules. Of course, the goal is to be compatible with Python in the sense that you will be able to mix Spy and Python code, import modules, and et cetera, but it's kind of opt-in. I have a new extension, which is .spy. Uh, so, like, you write new code. Instead of rewriting everything in Rust, let's rewrite everything in Spy, which is easier, basically. Um, but the goals is that I want something which is easy to understand, which is feels Pythonic. Like, if you don't know that you are writing Spy instead of Python, well, it doesn't feel much like, uh, unless you know all the details of what happens when you do dunder add and then you return not implement and then you do a lookup on the other uh, operand and blah, blah. Then if, if you don't know these rules, then probably nothing changes, not, not much changes for you. But I want something which is easy to implement because there is a value in having an implementation which is easy to write and to maintain. And I want something which doesn't have what I call performance cliffs. Like, if your optimization becomes too smart, then you arrive quickly at the point in which you have a program which is fast because the optimizer is able to guess what are the assumptions and how your program is behaving, and then maybe it's JIT compiles it very fastly, but then you change some line of code in an unrelated module, and then the JIT compiler don't, don't no longer, the assumption of the gene compiler don't, don't longer hold, and then everything becomes two times lower or ten times lower. This is something which I saw happening in PyPy, like for real. I, it, it's actually a good, very good job because people then came to me and uh, I had to consult them and to, to make the code fast, but like I don't think it's scalable. Um, so, like, the, the goal is really to have something in which performance is kind of built in and uh, it's easy to achieve. You don't, need a, you, don't, you don't need a PhD in order to understand what's going on and to get the best result. At a very, very high level, um, I mean, now I'm, I, briefly I will explain like kind of the rules of the language and uh, the way I want to reach this goal. But at a very high level, I think that we can think of languages in this two, with these two colors. So on the, on the left here, I have what I call high-level high language, which is usually implemented as an interpreter. And all the operations are kind of slow because they are like, the, any operation contains a lot of logic. So again, in Python, if you have A plus B, there is a lot of logic because you need to understand what exactly means, depending on the types, you do this, this, or that. And if it's one of the two is a custom class, you might want to, ch to call a method. And if the other is another kind of custom class, which is not a class of the first, I mean, there are a lot of rules like this. So I, I represent it as a um, operation, uh, like let's say complex operation in blue. On the, on the right side, we have low level language, let's say C, in which operations are really low level and very easy to compile. If you have A plus B in C, well, you know, they are integers, it's a one machine, like one uh, CPU instruction. And, and that's how you get the binary later. The idea of SPI is to mix these two levels together. So uh, you have something in which some of the operations are like low level and easy to compile, but you still have this high-level logic, which is actually makes Python nice, I claim. Uh, so you have this uh, graph, which contains both kind of operations, but once you have this kind of mental uh, schema, then you can take this and transform uh, this graph into something which is lower level. And I call this process red shifting, uh, because we are removing the blue part, and we, what's left is only the, the, um, the red part. And like, again, 
I'm, I'm going to talk more details what this means, but uh, uh, this is just to have like an idea of wo where we are going. So we want we start from Python and we tweak some of the semantics of the language in order to achieve that goal. And the third, the three biggest changes which I made are um, what I call like a formalization of a process which actually happens in practice, which is this, this distinction between logic which happens at import time and then what happens at runtime. I'll talk about it later. Then the other tweak to the semantics is that if you have a type annotation, it's actually enforced. So if you have a, a, a variable of a certain type and you assign a value of a different type, it's a, it's a runtime error. Like the, the, and this helps the compiler later to assume that this is true. And then whenever I have an operation, uh, I, um, I split the, the semantic of the op operation in two steps. The first is, well, let's understand what this operation means. And this is kind of the blue uh, um, code that I was showing earlier. It's all the, actually, what, what makes Python better than Java, for example, from my point of view. And then you have the execution phase in which, well, now that we found out that these are two integers and we want to uh, just add them, well, this is very easy to do because, but we, if we split these two phases explicitly, then for the compiler it's much easier to optimize. So execution phases. Um, in SPY we have uh, like formalized these three, three stages. Uh, when, whenever you um, compile a program or execute a, a program, Everything which happens at import time happens at a very specific beginning. Like it's kind of, it's actually what happens already in Python. Like a lot of stuff uh, happens when you import a module, but it could happen at any point in time. I can import a module well after 30 seconds of execution. In spite is not possible, like all the modules are discovered ahead of time and, and initialized. And then I have what I call the freeze phase and then, well, the extra execution of the program. Uh, at import time, it's very similar to what's happening. Like, uh, you can do all the crazy stuff that we like in Python. You can do um, uh, meta classes, you can do decorators, you can compute things that are needed later. Um, you can monkey patch your code in case of PyTest or something like this. So, like, a lot of stuff which are actually useful, they, 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 you can still do them. But then I have, well, the, this, this phase which is freeze, and then I declare that, well, this is over. Like, after a certain point in time, all the things which are kind of global become frozen and constant. And so it means that you can, you can monkey patch a class early in the execution, but not at, at runtime. And no, I think that this covers 99% like of the use cases anyway. Um, of course, sometimes you really want global mutable data, but you, you have to annotate it explicitly as variables, basically. And, um, and then, once I have initialized my system, I can just execute it as, as, as usual. Um, if you have this kind of schema, then something interesting can happen, because I have a lot of global constants, and I operate on them. And all the operation which I do on this global constant, well, they are kind of, they, they, you can optimize them away. Like, uh, if you have an if uppercase debug statement somewhere and the bug is a constant, well, you can, you, you know which, br which branch are you taking. Uh, but it, it can go farther than this. Like, if you do something which is very dynamic, like get out of, of a string on, on, on a class, but the string is constant, well, you can do optimize this away. Uh, if you have a list of URLs, URLs you are implementing fast API or something, and uh, this list of URLs is constant and frozen, well, you can unroll the loop and uh, and avoid uh, the um, the overhead of the for loop at runtime. So there are a lot of possibilities. It's super important that this phase is kind of transparent to the user, like. The, 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 I'm designing the rules in such a way that uh, you don't need to know about this. Like, 
it naturally flows, okay, it is constant, well, the, this operation will always get the same result. And then, of course, when I'm the compiler, well, I can optimize it away, but you don't need to know this. In order to implement this, I'm de developing two things at the same time. I'm developing the interpreter and the compiler. But the trick is that all the hard stuff can happen only at import time, and this is kind of, it's safe to be slow at that time. So, uh, in a, like, the, the import time and the partial version time are run by interpreter, which supports the full language. And then what's left after the partial version time, it's a, like a subset of the language, which is actually compilable. So the compiler knows only about this, this small part, so that's why it's easier to implement and, uh, and, and faster. And at this stage, the interpreter is incredibly simple and incredibly slow. Like, it's ASD-based, uh, it's written in, part, in Python, but okay, again, like, it supports the full semantics. And also the compiler is very simple. Uh, I'm trying to minimize time to market. I didn't want to do any fancier than it needs to be. So the simplest thing to do to get executable code is generate C code and use a C compiler. And actually, this opens a lot of possibilities. Right now, I can emit a C code and target kind of for free. I kind of target WebAssembly. I can target, I can target mscripten, which is mscript, uh, WebAssembly in the browser. I can target native code kind of for free. But the point is that, again, the, the compiler doesn't need to support the whole language because the, the hard part is taken care of earlier. And the magic happens at this stage, the partial evaluation. So imagine to have an AST. Uh, so you have your program represented as a graph, as a tree. And then I have a phase in which I go and color all the nodes and determine whether these nodes are blue, which means that I can safely partial evaluate them away because they, uh, they operate, for example, on constants or do this kind of operation which are guaranteed to be, um, to be optimizable. And then I have red nodes, which is what what's operates on actual data which varies at runtime. And red shift is what I was describing earlier. I transformed this blue plus red graph into a red only graph. I agree that so far it's very muddy, it's very foggy. Like, let's, let's see what happens in practice. So this is the super simple example. So I have a function, k, okay, which could do arbitrary computation. In this case, it just does some numeric addition, uh, like numeric expression. But I, I could download something from the internet here. I could uh, do open a CSV file and do computation. I could do whatever. I annotate this as blue. So it is a blue function. It's guaranteed to be executed at import time, at partial evaluation time, and uh, that it's, it's, this is not executed at, uh, um, it's not seen by the compiler. And I can show you, uh, where do I have it? I think it's here. So it's bluefunk.spy. Blue what I can show you is that, for example, I, I have this red shift phase in, uh, in which basically I get spy program in input and I emit a spy program in output after this partial evaluation. So it's blue from the spy, and you see that what's remaining is just, is just the function after evaluating, after calling the blue. Uh, and you could say, okay, but any C compiler can do this. That is not particularly smart, and I agree with you. Um, but the point is that this is gu guaranteed. Like, it's not an optimization in the same set that I hope the compiler will do it. It's guaranteed by the rule of the language that this function is called earlier. But once we have this, um, this process and this schema, we can do interesting stuff. So imagine a closure. Like, in this example, I have a function which makes another function. Make other creates an other function which has uh, one operand fixed. So I can create add five and add seven and then call them. This is, I mean, this is perfectly normal Python code. Like we, we, we kind of, this, this probably works only, uh, like surely works also in Python if you remove the blue annotation. But what happens if I, so this is make other.spy. So what happens if I redshift it? 
And let's also try to highlight it. So as you can see, the make other closure is gone because it was blue, so it's partially evaluated away. What's left are the two concrete functions which contains the concrete values that I, I, um, I selected. So I kind of created dynamic, like dynamically but statically, add five and add seven, and you can see that when I have fn here, it, this is like a special syntax which I invented uh, to, uh, to signal that I'm calling like a fully qualified name. And also like the lookup, it's another example of, of this. In Python, whenever you look up a name, well, it, it needs to search the namespace, the local, and the globals, and the module, and, and blah, blah. But in, in spite, this lookup can be optimized away. So the way I represent in the, in the AST is with this fully qualified strings in which I'm calling not the add five function which is somewhere. I'm calling the add five function which is in this module which is called make other. And, and this doesn't change. And when, again, another thing which flows naturally from it is type checking. So here we have something which contains an error maybe. So I have a function which increments an integer, and I can call it on an integer, and, but if I call it on a string, well, that's obviously an error. What do you think it happens if I call, if I run this? Because, of course, I also have an interpreter, right? So I can just run this code. What do you think it happens? Please, someone answer. What? Yes, so someone says print 42. I think that someone else was saying, well, error because it's a type error. So it's actually both. So if I, uh, what is type error of the spy? If I try to run it, well, it, it prints 42 because I'm not executing this branch. But what's happening is that the, the red shifter know that in this branch, this is a type error. So what's happening is that it creates something like this. So the, the type check has been partially evaluated away and it remains what array. What, what's remaining is arrays. Actually, asterisk, this, this is not implemented yet. Uh, it, it will, but it, I mean, actually, I'm not, I, I'm not far, far from it. Uh, but once you have this kind of modality, you can choose, like, we have branches in the code, and we know that if you take these branches, then you have, a, you have a type error. And then you can choose what to do. You can choose to have what I call lazy error, which is a behavior very, very similar to what you have in Python now. Or you can choose to have eager errors, which basically is every time I partially wait something and I see there is a static, like uh, a type error, I can, well, make it a, 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 a hard error and fail the compilation. That's actually what any static type language does. That's what happens if you do a type error in C or a type error in Java. And it's, I, there, is, there are values on both. If you are doing a refactoring and you are changing the name of the method and you want to run the test, you want to run them one by one and fix things incrementally. Uh, but if you want to deploy, you would like to know all your type errors in advance. That's what you do with MyPy or PyWrite. So you will be able to choose both because there is values in both, in both options. So from some point of view, whenever, whenever this becomes a, a static race, well, by default it's a warning somehow, but I can turn warnings into errors. And I can show you, like, if I have this code, which is type error, I mean, what I showed before, if I try to run, it's type error. But if I try to compile, for example, to native code, then I get, well, the, the classic compiler error that you would expect. I'm also spending a lot of time trying to make errors very nice to read and very useful to, because like, I don't want, oh, type error. Like, uh, the compiler is trying hard to, to make it easier to understand what's going on. And then let's go one step further. So we have type annotations. I mean, we have a function which takes uh, um, parameters and these parameters have types. But the type, well, in Python is just an expression. And in Spy as well. Uh, I can create 
type and functions passing a type as a parameter. So in this example, I'm making a function f, the function fn, and the two parameters it takes, well, are a generic type t, which is passed from, from, um, from outside. And, well, uh, this is generic.c. If I redshift this, what I, oh, let's, let's, what I get is that I get two function specialized on the type. And again, the specialization happens at partial version time, at the redshift time. So basically, automatically, from the rules of the language which I explained before, we automatically have generics. It's the equivalent of C++ templates. But in a way which is totally understandable without having to learn about the strange thing which are C++ templates. You can totally put a PDB, when I, when I will have PDB, uh, inside, uh, inside a function and see what are the values of t because it's a first class uh, object. Uh, currently, this is the way you do. In the future, I plan to experiment with some syntax sugar. So maybe I, you will be able to write something like this in which the, the type is actually like in square brackets. But I mean, this is something for the future. I haven't experimented with it yet. But the core logic is that it is like a closure in which some parameters are fixed ahead of time. And you remember when I was talking about operation dispatch? Like in Python, there is a lot of logic just to, that you need to do at every step just to try to understand what to do with operation. Like you have A plus B, well, where is the implementation? A lot of logic. Um, in Spy, this is like two steps. The first is the implementation lookup. And then I have the actual, uh, I call the implementation to do the actual operation. And the lookup is based on static types. So if, I, if you have x plus b, uh, x plus y, what you do is to get the two static types of the expression, and then I call this special function, which is in the operator module, which is op uppercase add, which returns a function which you can call with the values to do the execution. And if the, 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 the cool thing is that these three lines are blue. So they are part of the semantics, but then they are optimized away. So I, I, in the process of looking up the, the operation, I can do all the crazy stuff that I'm used to do in Python. I can do have descriptors. I can use all the dunder methods that I have. I can do all the complicated logic that I want, but I don't pay the cost at runtime. What's, what's left at runtime is just the fast execution. Um, I think I have a demo also, yes. Op dispatch.py. So in this example, I, I want to show you what happens if I just call the add operator. And uh, I, I call it on three, uh, in three cases. So what happens if I ask for the implementation of the, for i32, i32, and then what happens if I want to add two strings, and what happens if you want to add one string and a number? And you can see that basically in the first two cases, it returns a function, a built-in function which knows how to add integers and strings, but in the last cases, well, it returns me a not implemented value. And then the type checker knows that when you do an operation and, the, and you cannot find an implementation for the operation, well, it's a type error, basically. So that's, that's how we build up our semantics. But it goes farther than this. Like a get out is just a specific case of this general logic. So if I have x.name, then basically in spy, this becomes equivalent of calling the down uppercase get out on, but using name as a string. And, and with this, again, we, we can do all the crazy logic that we want. We can implement um, Pydentic with uh, validation. We can do all, all uh, like um, SQL alchemy but using this logic without paying the, the runtime cost of it. Like if, 
if you have been, uh, uh, if you follow it, my, my explanation, you might have the question that I'm changing the semantics again here because in Python, the, the load, if you have a function which takes two arbitrary objects and you add any, do any operation on it, the, um, the actual implementation depends on the dynamic type. It depends on what is at runtime. Like if I do A plus B, well, I can pass both integers and strings and uh, um, the interpreter knows how to do their correct stuff. But in Spy, the operation becomes, depends on the static type. And the static type, well, it's, I don't know what will be at runtime because it might be different. Maybe I have a subclass. Maybe I have, uh, a, 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 again, a generic uh, object which could be anything. So the, the other divergence from the semantics of Python is that if I have uh, a variable of type object, it, by default it doesn't support much operation. Well, X plus Y, where X and Y are objects, it, it's a type error. But sometimes it's still useful to have a super dynamic lookup because I don't really know. In that case, well, you can opt in with, what, with the type which I call dynamic, and then it will do the runtime lookup of operation. Basically, with dynamic, you do the blue and red stuff at runtime, but it's, it's a penalty that you pay only when you want. You don't pay by default. That, that's kind of the idea. And uh, we are almost at the end, uh, so like this is basically what I have so far. I, something that I didn't say earlier, like this is super work in progress. So like what I have so far is what I showed. Uh, so I have this interpreter, the compiler, uh, partial evaluation. I claim it's kind of the hard part, um, but I still have to build a lot of the language. Like I don't have lists and I don't have dictionaries, so it's not really useful for now. But once you have like the basic rules in place, like it should be easy to, to add this. It's just, an, just engineering. Um, but what, with what I have so far, I can already see that things are working in the way I intended. So for example, I, I'm trying to write uh, what I call like an FFI for C, so I want to access low level um, uh, pieces of memory as, as if it were a C struct. So I, I know that I have uh, 128 bytes and the first, the first 64 are uh, the, 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 um, the X field of a point and the second 64 are the um, Y field of a point. And I can do it in Python, but if I do it, then what, well, you need descriptors, and every time you do point.x or point.y, well, you pay all this performance. And in Spy, I, I can have basically something like this. This is kind of syntax sugar because it doesn't really work right now, but it's just because of syntax. Like, the, uh, like I, I have this actually running uh, uh, with a slightly different syntax, and uh, I, I, I can guarantee it works. So I have this this uh, class point, which has this X and Y, which are fields, and fields are, well, objects with a dunder get, which is basically the spy equivalent of the descriptor protocol. And whenever I do point.x and point.y, then I do all this double lookup of blue plus red, the blue is optimized away, and what's left is a call of this. This is like the primitive which I have, which is row buffer, so row buffer get of int knows how to read from, from the machine, like from a CPU point of view, 64 bits in the, into the register. It's something that the C compiler can, can compile to the single instruction. So, no, I think it's here. I, I, I told you that like the syntax right now, it's a bit different. So this is what I would like eventually, but I don't have. So in this, in so far, I have to write the class like this because I don't support the class, the class keyword yet. But um, if I, and you see you have like your function foo, which instantiate a point and then does, well, set the values and then get the values of x. And if I do redshift, And 
let's also highlight it. And then all the infrastructure for the class and, and the code, which is kind of low, went away. And what's left is this very low level function. And you see, instead of p dot x equals something, well, I'm calling this function, which was automatically generated by the partial evaluator. And this just calls row buffer set i32 using the offset 0. And this is the offset 4. So this is stuff that normally I wouldn't have to compute the offset at runtime, which is costly for a, such an easy operation. But all the expensive stuff was done earlier. And I can also write it to C. And then if I uh, struct.c, this is the, what, what's, gener what's generated. But you can see that also in C, basically, Instead of having pair.x, well, I'm calling basically this function, but this function calls this one, again, with the offset, which is a constant, and this is a, a macro, basically, in C, so it will, it, eventually, it will become like a, a direct set. So this is the first demo. And the second, which I still have a uh, few minutes, is basically uh, interaction with uh, uh, JavaScript, because um, I am also targeting WebAssembly. Um, so for interaction with JavaScript, I would like something like this. I would like basically to be able to do window, the document, or element by ID or something, and then call um, and set attributes. But all this stuff needs to happen on the JavaScript side. And uh, I would like to basically translate this high-level code automatically into this low-level code, which is what I need to do to talk with JavaScript. I don't want to write this code by hand, because it's horrible. I want a nice API on top of this low-level code. But I don't want to pay penalties, basically. In Python, what you do is this. Like, I, I, I can wrap all JavaScript values into a JSREF class, and then every time I do a get out, then I, I call this JS get out function, and then and then wrap the result. But again, in Python, all this is penal. every every layer of abstraction in Python adds runtime penalty. In Spy, I can do basically this. It's very similar, but I am using this uppercase get out so that uh, the wrapper and unwrapping is basically um, done and optimized away by the partial evaluation. So I can, uh, um, I can show you that this code, I don't, I don't have time to show, actually show you, but this code automatically becomes this, which is also translated to C. So the overhead of this translation is, uh, goes away. And well, since I am out here, here, I can show you that it's actually working. And uh, I think that's it. Where we can go in the future? As I said, everything is super work in progress. What uh, uh, we can use Spy for uh, generating WebAssembly modules. We can use Spy for generating standalone scripts. But in the future, I plan to go in the direction of integration with CPython. You can use Spy for, instead of Python, let's say, to build extensions. Uh, I can imagine using Spy with a Cinder backend. Cinder is a, a Python JIT compiler developed by Meta, which uses kind of, uh, it can use static types to be generate better code. So I can use Py to remove all the high level of red and, and then with Cinder uh, have a fast code. But that's every, uh, stuff which I still need to explore. So I think I'm done. Okay, a uh, microphone. The microphone seems a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative talk. We have time for a little bit of Q&A. We put up two microphones here on the side. So if anybody still has a question after this, uh, you can get up to the microphone and ask your question. And I also looked at the Discord channel where you can follow all these talks at home. 
In the Discord channel, I have not seen a question yet. So let's see, but we have a brave person at the microphone. So please ask your question. Hello, uh, the project looks very promising and it's interesting, but I haven't uh, found a reference uh, where we can try it. Oh. I just uh, uh, tried to Google it or DuckDuckGo it or find it on PyPy and didn't succeed. So, so yeah, so uh, like the, this is a bit unfortunate because like the, the repo, I mean, the, the code is open source, the repo is on GitHub, uh, github.com, spylang, spy. Uh, the Thank documentation, you. let's say, is a bit lacking. <laughs> um, uh, what happened is that I worked furiously to arrive at this point to have a demo, and I, I did the talk at PyCon a few weeks ago in the US, and so I, all, all the call for the demo was kind of like made on a spike, and now what I'm doing is to uh, refactor code from this branch and put it into reasonable code, and then I will, well, document. Uh, but yes, basically, the, you can try to clone this repo and look at the test, but that's the best I can say. Or, or, or you can find me um, around and I can show you, basically, yes. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, at the other microphone, please ask your question. Um, really interesting project. Uh, I just had one question that I see that with Spy, you kind of regenerate some code. And I'm worried, would you not run into the same problems that you run into with templates in C++, where there's too much generated code? And then it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a lot of stuff. And then also, like, how would you debug it? How, how you? How would you debug, you know, when you have an issue here? How would you debug the generated code, or how would it go? Uh, so, yes. Uh, Every, every language with the genetics has this problem, so uh, if you're not careful, you can, uh, can end up with code bloat. Uh, Rust does a good job at merging back uh, code which, which, uh, which is like generic, but then uh, it can be shared, so I, I hope to be able to do something like that. Uh, but then it really depends. At some point, it, it, it depends on you. Like, if you, if you know what you're writing, and uh, you want maximum performance, but you have to specialize. Like, imagine that you are NumPy, and you want, you want, you want to write uh, um, operation on arrays. You want to specialize them on your type. So you, you must have does this uh, like, uh, on specialization. But in other cases, you, you know that this is not um, on a path which is super important for performance, so you can, just, you can use the dynamic type. Then you don't specialize, and you pay the, pe the penalty at runtime, but it's fine. So, well, you will have control on it. Thank you very much. We have time for one final very brief question. I see that you're using annotations to annotate all of your types. Can you infer the types through data flow analysis, kind of like, oh, I don't know, PyPy used to? Uh, I, I suppose in theory it's possible. I don't think it's a good idea. So uh, I, uh, a lot of the ideas from Spy come from R Python, which was like the implementation language for PyPy. R Python was um, didn't use type annotation and it used like full program analysis to do type inference, which in theory seems seems like a good idea, but in practice it was not because. Okay, it's time over. That's okay. okay. Uh, that's okay. Um, we are running out of time, so at this point, I would just like to thank the speaker, Antonio Cuno, again. Let's have another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take.